Okay, that was an okay kind of praise, right? But okay. But our God is not okay. He's greatly to be praised, right? So now give it a great praise to the Lord. Come on, give it up. I know you can do it better than that, church. He's been so good to us. He's been so good to us.
My name is Maureen Smith, and I like coming to Cathedral because it is a ministry that truly loves people and that um, God is tremendously blessing, has blessed me, has blessed my family through coming to this ministry, and we welcome to come and be a part.
mighty God. Lift your hands in the presence of the Father. Just acknowledge the presence of the Lord in this place. Welcome Him. Welcome Him. Welcome Him. We're not seeking for that religion or tradition of man. We're seeking for Jesus Christ. He is, He is a Lord. He's, he is our Savior. so happy that you joined the program and watched the Word from Glory on the TCT Network. But we also want to invite you to attend the Cathedral of His Glory. We're here every single Sunday for you. And if you're in the Greensboro area or you're residents of Greensboro, please accept this as the invitation to come by and worship with us and be part of the service that you see on a Word from Glory right here in Greensboro, North Carolina, the Cathedral of His Glory.
All time is lineal. What do you mean, pastor? Well, it has a beginning, it has an end. It goes in a straight line. Eternity, however, has no beginning, has no end. God's eternal. And when we're born again, we move in two planes. As Christians, we move in the lineal, but we are also in the eternal. Now, the Apostle Paul, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, prays for the church. Most people reading this say, well, it's in the Bible. But yes, but it's a prayer. And he's praying that the church will move to understand and move to see into the eternal, not just into the lineal. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Therefore I, Paul, also after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now here's the prayer. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of the inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that's named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet, gave him the head of over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills all and all. Amen. Whew. I pray that your wisdom... And your revelation might come that you'll see not only in the lineal in time, but you'll see in eternity the glory that your Father has already given unto the church. But it comes by wisdom and revelation. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Difference between knowing here and the Greek word kenosis, knowing there. There's a difference in the way it's given. In the book of Isaiah, in the Old Testament, the 11th chapter, Isaiah writes of Jesus. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Now listen. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Wisdom is a spirit. I'm pausing because I want you to learn something. Wisdom is a spirit. Wisdom is a gift of the spirit from God. And Jesus received, Jesus received the spirit of wisdom from the Father. Now, I can't help but shock you with some things. I know more than Moses knew. Pastor, how can you say such a thing? Moses didn't have the New Testament. He didn't have the cross. He didn't know about that. I know more than Isaiah knew. I knew more than Job. 
My goodness. Now I'm going to say something even more shocking. I know things Jesus didn't know about. Oh, 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 Pastor, now you've got in the deep water. No, no. Jesus divested himself of his Godhead while he was on this earth. He was totally God, but he was totally man. He did not know about a choo choo train. <laughs> no, he didn't. He was a citizen of Nazareth of his time. He didn't know about the things in time. He knew about heavenly things. He knew all the things about God. He didn't know how to drive an automobile. I almost say I do, but I really don't. I <laughs> uh, my wife uh, through the graciousness of her Lord Jesus and her husband traded up and got another car and she, she allowed me to drive it to Florida. I had to take my granddaughter along to figure out the computers on the car and I still don't know them. Because that car thing does things that cars don't do. You know, it's fantastic. But Jesus didn't know about all those things. He didn't know about lights. He didn't know about sound systems. He didn't know about all these things. But he knew all of the wisdom of God, and it was a spirit. Now, there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. See, you may not have knowledge of anything. You may not understand higher physics, but you may have wisdom. The Greek sophist, what's a sophist? A philosopher, a mathematician, by the name of Gergis, he proved, he proved that something can't move by knowledge. <laughs> I'm pausing because I want you to get a hold of this. I want, to give you, I want to give you his thing, okay? He says, first of all, a thing cannot move from where it was because if it does, it's not where it was. Okay? Now, second, it cannot move from where it is not. That's obvious. Third, where it is and where it is not are the only possible places there are. Therefore, it's mathematically impossible for a thing to move. That's knowledge. But you say, wait a minute, I saw that car move. I said, no, he just proved by knowledge it can't move. But that's not wisdom, that's knowledge. Wisdom goes beyond knowledge. Wisdom is a spiritual gift. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, the 4th verse. 1 Corinthians 12, 4. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministrations, or ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities. It's the same God who works in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. To one is given the word of wisdom. Whoa. <laughs> to another, a word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Now these are supernatural gifts. The word of knowledge is knowing something you didn't learn in school. God teaches you. The word of wisdom is something God gives you how to operate in that knowledge, whether it's spiritual or whether it's natural. God gives you a gift of wisdom. To another faith by the same Spirit. There's a gift of faith. To another healings of the same spirit. To another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another interpretation tongue. But one of the same spirit works all these things, distributing each one individually as he wills. The spirit, the Holy Spirit, gives individuals gifts according as he chooses. 
But there's one gift we can all have. Somebody may have a gift of healing. Somebody else may have a gift of tongues. But there's one gift everybody listening to my voice can have. And that's the gift of wisdom. Pastor, James, the book of James, the first chapter, the fourth verse, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may per- be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, not doubting. He who doubts is like a wave and a sea driven and tossed by the wind. Let not a man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his way. I had some people that left the church. They said, the reason we're leaving is you're a double-minded man. I said, okay, tell me why. They said, you can't build a church and be an evangelist and do evangelistic work at the same time. You either got to be the pastor or you got to do the work of the evangelist. Wait just a minute. Paul, writing to Timothy, set him aside as a pastor and told him to do the work of the evangelist. A pastor has to be able to do both. Every Christian has to do the same thing. There's the gift of the evangelist, but everyone is a soul winner. Or supposed to be. Amen. Oh, I had a great experience this week. My goodness, I was... <laughs> at the right time, at the right place. Uh, uh, Some of you know I was with Dr. Rodney Howard Brown in the Great Awakening Service in Florida at the right time because the report came in at the second day they had reached one million souls for Christ. Since January. One million souls for Christ. I'm saying, oh Lord, and I'm part of this. Yeah, and he even invited me to speak. Oh, I'm part. I can, whew, I can be, oh, 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 oh. Yes. Gentleman, a little bit older than I am, I think. Uh, maybe be, be close there. The president of one of the largest Christian television nations, uh, television networks in the nation, told Rodney, he said, sir, I'll give you my airtime in prime time every night as long as it takes for one reason. I don't need the money. God's blessed me. I don't need the money. I want to give it to you because before I go with the Lord, I want to have won through my television a million souls. And he gave Rodney the whole network. (laughs) Others were mad because they were paying for time. He said, I'm sorry. I'd rather have souls than money. I'd rather have souls than money give you the wisdom to deliver souls. So if you lack wisdom or revelation, what are you to do? Ask and receive by faith. Now some of you immediately turn off and say, well that's just spiritual. No, it's asking wisdom for any problem you have, any need you have, anything in your life you need. If you're a child of God, you have a right to go to the Father and say, Father, give me wisdom as to handle this problem in my life. And believe by faith that God will bring that revelation to you. I was born a third generation Mormon, that is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It was 28 years old before I had an encounter with Jesus Christ that changed my entire life and turned me into a Christian minister. All these years I've been wanting to write a book about the Mormon experience 
not mine, but the early history of the Mormon Church. I chose to do it in a novel called Deseret. The name comes from Brigham Young, the second prophet of the Mormon Church, who wanted to build a kingdom from the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific, where the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints formed by Joseph Smith would supply him with 10% of their offerings and also allow him to keep a polygamous kingdom. The story involves a couple that are caught up into the move west because they have something very valuable that Joseph Smith wants. It's the printing press, where he can print the Book of Mormon and the Pearl of Great Price and the Doctrine and Covenants and even his own currency. It's a venture story. It's a love story. It's a story of people seeking the truth and finding out it wasn't the celestial kingdom and the temples of Joseph Smith, but a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I think you'll be in Heist by the book. I don't think you'll be able to turn it down. You'll turn one page after the other. Deseret, my new novel. It can be found on the internet, Westbow, on Amazon.com, or here at the Cathedral of His Glory. I urge you to get it and to read it. I think you'll find it an exciting read, and it'll be relevant to today. Deseret. First Corinthians, the second chapter. The 13th verse. These things we speak, not in words of men's wisdom teaches. Compare spiritual things with spiritual. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged of no one. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Wow. I, I stand in awe of what the God is saying. No. He says, the Christian can understand. The not, listen, some folks watching by television right now, I'm speaking mysteries to you. I know that. We spoke last week on the international television, and we talked about the divine trinity. And people don't understand that. I know they don't understand it. The Bible talks about it being the mystery of God, that God was incarnate in Christ. You say, well, he couldn't have been because God was still in heaven and Jesus was on the earth. God's in this room and he's in China at the same time. Because he's God. He walked this earth in flesh in Jesus, but that didn't just take one thing away from the Godhead of heaven. But the natural man don't understand that. The natural man don't understand that I'm standing in this auditorium speaking to you, but I'm not only, only here. I'm also in heaven. I am seated with Christ in heavenly places. Therefore, I ought to have two sets of eyes, one eye to see you and one eye to see in heaven, because I'm in both places at the same time. <laughs> Pastor. No. Oh. He says the natural man can't understand it, but the spiritual man the man in the spirit, the man that's asking God and receiving revelation from the spirit can receive in both areas. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.12. Therefore, since we have such hope, we have great boldness of speech. And like Moses who put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when he turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we with unveiled face, beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed in the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. I've been reading this book for 50 years. I've been preaching this book for 50 years. 
And yet, I read a passage that I've not only read, but I've taught. And suddenly I say, wow, was that there? Why didn't I see that before? God says, you have on your religious glasses. You didn't see them. I just open your eyes that you can see that. I'll go running, Mary, Mary, Mary. You see what that says? You know what makes me mad? She'll say, well, of course. Didn't you know that? <laughs> Mel won't get mad at you. always showed her and you didn't show me. What's going on here? <laughs> the Holy Spirit is something. When, uh, back in the days when we were in college and seminary, I had to do 16 hours of school. College, that's a lot of college hours. Support the family. Preach every Sunday, pastor a church. Look back and see how did we do this. But many times, I would wake up and go in my study, and there would be the sermon. All tied down. And I'd come down, I'd say, honey, 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 where did this come from? She said, well, last night you rolled out of bed, jumped up, ran out there, and went back to sleep. And I'll say, oh, this is good. <laughs> oh, man. Oh. And you look at me, no, no. The Spirit of the Lord, he comes. He opens eyes to see what you could not see. There's another Greek word I want to give you. Photozo. It comes from photography. It means illuminated, filled with light. Translate intelligent. Plato, the Greek philosopher, said it means the eyes of the soul. There's a lot of people see with the eyes of the head, but can't see with the eyes of the soul. The eyes of the soul sees things that other people cannot see. The English painter, Turner, was great for painting landscapes. And he painted this beautiful sunset. And a woman walking in the art gallery looked at it and looked at it. She said, Mr. Turner, I have never seen a sunset like that. He said, don't you wish you could? Well, he had seen it. That's why he could paint it. He saw it with the eyes of his soul. God says, I'll give you wisdom and knowledge that man can't possibly figure out. Amen. One of the most magnificent architecturally designed building in the world in history was Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. God said for the first time in his Bible that he would give the spirit to do cunning work to build that. Now, I want to show you something really, real surprising about Hiram, who built the temple. 1 Kings, the sixth chapter. You need to look at this. No, 1 Kings, yeah, 6, 6. The lowest changer, chamber was five cubits wide. The middle was six cubits wide. The third was seven cubits wide. For he made narrow ledges around the outside of the temple so that the support beams would not be fastened into the walls of the temple. So the support beams would not be fastened into the walls of the temple. And the temple, when it was being built, was built with stone finished at the quarry, so that no hammer or chisel or any iron tool was heard in the temple while it was being built. If the eyes of your understanding just opened up, the doorway for the middle story was on the right side of the temple. Went up by stairs to the middle story and from the middle to the third. So he built the temple and finished it. And he paneled the temple with beams of boards of cedar. Not one hammer beat. Not one chisel. Not one cutting of stone. All the wood was finished outside. All the stones were cut at the quarry. Hiram overseed, ever, looked over everything, ever saw everything. He did it with the Spirit of God. When the block came in, 
it fit perfectly. When the wood beam came in, it fit perfectly. So they didn't even need a nail. In all of Solomon's temple, God gave him such vision that he could see down to the very microscopic part of an inch and put it there. Now somebody looking old me, old me. Mary's father, Stephen Roberts, they called him old eagle eye. I've seen him do it. He'd be putting mold in around the house. He'd look, he'd say, he'd cut that piece of mold in, he'd hand it to the carpenter, and it would fit, slide right in place so that you didn't even have a crack on either side. He could do it. I don't know how he did it. No measure, no tape, no ruler, it fit. Strangest thing to me was, we were dating Mary, and she had this purple or lavender or something like that dress, and the button top fell off. He said, here, Jane, that's what he called her. He said, I'll fix that. He went and got him a can of paint, took some black, some green, a little red, mixed it up, painted it. He says, here, don't look anything like it, Daddy. He says, it's not dry yet. When it dried, you couldn't tell where the button had been. The difference. And some of you look at me, no, no. <laughs> he mixed some paint and was painting a ceiling in the house. Got a message and had to leave. And when he came back, he couldn't find out where he'd stopped and where he started. The color was that perfect. Now, how did he do it? This man had no education, no college degree, no scholarship, nothing like that. But he was a praying man. And God helped me, helped me in my work, helped me to know how to do things. I met a full gospel businessman years ago. He had become very wealthy because there was a problem in these big tanks that they put oil and chemicals in. And the problem was cleaning after the chemicals had been in there because the chemicals adhered to the metal and made a little rough stuff inside. And they had all kinds, they put all kinds of chemicals in there, tried to get that stuff clean. They couldn't clean it, they couldn't. And he had the chance to bid on it. And I mean, to be a major contractor just cleaning those tanks. He said he got in his study, got on his knees and said, God, nobody's found the answer to this. I need an answer. And he heard a voice and said, tide. He said, the ocean's got nothing to do with it. Tide don't come in and out. Tide. He says, I wonder if God means laundry detergent. <laughs> so he got him a bucket, had some of those chemicals, put Tide in it, and it cleaned it. He never told anybody till later his secret. But he got the contract of cleaning all of those big tanks all over New Jersey, and he was using plain old Tide laundry detergent, and it was cleaning it. And God had told him, Tide? <laughs> and he cleaned it. He asked God, you think, well, God will only give you the revelation of the Bible. No. He'll give you divine ideas on how to prosper. He, ladies, he'll, if you prayed before you married that joker, he'd have told you not to marry her or told you who to. <laughs> he said he'll give you the spirit of wisdom and knowledge and revelation. Uh, and it means here as well as there. But he wants you to know here and in heaven what he's doing. That the eyes of your soul might be open. Uh, well, I'll give you a scripture. Turn to Psalms 119. Verse 18. 
Another prayer. Prayer of Solomon. And David, open my eyes that I may see the wondrous things from your law, from your word. What? Ephesians 1.18, that scripture again. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know the hope of his calling or the riches of his glory in the inheritance of his saints. Now, a man who's deaf and has never heard can still play music. What? If he can read notes. But he never hears it. He knows what it is. Now, Beethoven conducted great symphonies while he was deaf, but he had heard it. Now he could hear it in his mind and rewrite it and create it. But that deaf man, a blind man, can know the chemicals to put together to make color, but he never sees it. The same things with a Christian. He can know great things and never see into God's kingdom and never know what's coming until he was what? He asked for wisdom. Logic and reason, theology can describe God but not know him. You can be sprinkled as a baby but you don't know him. You can be baptized. I was at eight years old, but didn't know him. You can become a church member and not know him. There's millions and millions of people in the world today that are religious, but they've never known him. Ye must be born again. Have you ever asked yourself, what am I here for? What is my purpose in life? Have you gone day to day wondering or feeling like your life is without value and trying to find purpose in areas or in experiences or in relationships or in success and you just are dissatisfied because you're not finding what you're looking for? I want to invite you to come to the Cathedral of His Glory. I want to tell you that God loves you and has a specific plan for your life, that you are not an afterthought, but you are in his forethought. And as you come and experience what he is, who he is, I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about a relationship. A true God who created you knows you and accepts you for who you are. That's what church ought to be like. That is what the cathedral of his glory is like. I don't care what background you've come from. I don't care if you are rich or poor. I don't care if you're homeless. We accept and love people of all race, of all color, of all backgrounds, because that's the heart of God. And when, no matter what you're experiencing in your life today, we want to invite you to come and join with us and see that God has a plan for you.